Hi everyone, and welcome back to my channel. Uh, my name is Jonathan Riddell, and today we are going to talk about why entropy can be considered the most primitive and important concept one can think of when describing systems of many particles. Odds are, you've heard of entropy. Entropy, to many people, is this loosely defined quantity that always increases under various thermodynamic processes. It is often said, for example, that the entropy of the universe is always increasing. If you were to search on YouTube or Google, odds are you'll run into a few different explanations, some of which are more satisfying than others. We all, for example, have heard the mysterious and ambiguous statement that entropy tells you how much disorder is in the system. But what does disorder really mean in this context? Higher entropy doesn't necessarily mean things are messier or less organized. Remember, these words are being applied to real systems of particles moving around, interacting, exchanging energy and exchanging momentum, and so on. So what does disorder really mean here? Another interpretation one might find is that entropy is the amount of energy dispersal in the system. The more the energy is uniformly spread out in the system, the higher the entropy. People who attempt to explain entropy this way often cite the second law of thermodynamics, which states that for a reversible process, a small change in the entropy, ds, is a result of a small transfer of heat, delta q, divided by the temperature. In a way, this is fine and is definitely consistent with what entropy is, so perhaps we're doing a lot better here. But we are using temperature, an emergent property of many particles. So is this somehow circular? Many textbooks will define the thermodynamic temperature in terms of the entropy itself, where the inverse of temperature is equal to the change in the entropy divided by the change in the energy, where we keep the volume and the number of particles fixed. Or to put it more mathematically, it is the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy while keeping the volume and the particle number fixed. So at least for me, this leaves much to be desired in ways of a definition. If you take anything away from this channel, it is that thermodynamics and statistical mechanics are fields of physics which attempt to deal with lots of particles all at once. Therefore, it is desirable to understand the terms and definitions of things like entropy in terms of what is actually happening underneath the hood. Thermodynamics and statistical mechanics work because of the laws of nature, and therefore should have a complete description in terms of them. So moving on, perhaps a more experienced student might say, well, actually, entropy has a great different uh, definition from first principles. Boltzmann gave us his famous entropy formula, which states that entropy is equal to the Boltzmann constant, which is some number, times the logarithm of the total number of microstates. This is indeed how most textbooks on statistical mechanics will introduce the quantity, and of course it is, a, it is perfectly correct. But you might be wondering, in this context, what exactly is a microstate, what is a macrostate, and why is entropy that expression in particular? So, let's jump into it. To develop the conversation and describe what entropy is from a subjective point of view, we need to have a common language or a simple model to think about these questions. Here we decide to go with the spin, where each component of the system can be in one of two configurations. We say that when the spin is pointed up, we assign it the energy E, and when we have a spin down, we give it zero energy. This is obviously an extremely idealized situation, but is sufficient to communicate the concepts we are interested in. These concepts are, are of course, uh, much more generic. With this model in mind, we can think of a system with four spins where we ignore any interactions they might have in between each other to avoid further complicated, complicating the problem. On the left, we have a microstate which specifies the direction of each unique spin. On the right, we have what is called a macrostate, a state with only big picture information. Specifically, this information is, is that there is 3E e energy in the system of four spins, since we have three up and one down, where the label length or the number of spins, we label it by L. 
the macro state doesn't tell us about the finer detail of what is actually happening, but in most cases, this macro information is all we have access to. So there's an obvious problem with our macroscopic information, and that is even with four spins, it doesn't tell us enough about the system to guess which microstate we're in. Given our macro information, we can easily see that there are four microstates that this might correspond to. Now, what if we actually had a million spins? Specifying only energy in this case would make it virtually impossible to figure out what ma microstate we are in, or in any case, even write down all of the possible microstates we could possibly be in. So we see the information one has access to when trying to describe properties of a system of many particles is actually extremely sparse compared to the amount of information needed to fully describe what is actually happening for every single particle. To explore this a little further, we can consider the general counting problem we're faced with. For example, what if we had four spins, but like this microstate shown here, we only had half spins up and half down. Then you might be able to convince yourself that the number of states that have half up and half down with four spins is six total microstates. And if we had no restrictions on the energy and we just asked how many microstates are possible by letting each spin be either up or down for four spins, we would see that the total number is 16. There is actually quite the easy way of doing these counting problems. If we let L be anything, we see that there are two to the power of L total microstates possible with various energies. If we fix the energy, thereby fixing the total number of upspins, where we label the number of upspins by U, we see that there are L choose U total microstates consistent with that energy. We can see here that these quantities grow quite quickly with L, you know, outside of the trivial case, cases of say, you know, all of the spins are up or all of the spins are down. So in reality, we are faced with the following problem. For systems of many participating particles, we are given too little information macroscopically to say what each individual particle is actually doing. Appreciating that fact, we instead resign ourselves to assigning probabilities to the available microstates in our system. These probabilities are informed by the macro information we have on hand. Pictured here, we have the four spin system where we take it that three spins are up. To each microstate, we assign a probability that says with a probability P1, we are in the microstate seen here on the upper left-hand corner of the screen. This process is called a statistical inference. This way of looking at things will allow us to compute average properties of systems that are consistent with the macroscopic information that we have been given. So how do we determine these probabilities in a way that isn't biased? It turns out that there is a special function to inform our choice. This special function is called the Shannon entropy. The Shannon entropy quantifies the uncertainty inherent in a probability distribution. Seen here, it is the sum of the probabilities times the natural logarithms of themselves. Here we wrote the Shannon entropy in such a way that there are n possible outcomes to assign probabilities to, where outcomes here for us mean microstates. The constant k is usually set up to our convenience depending on the problem, and in our case has a physical meaning that we'll see later. It has a negative multiplying the whole expression uh, out front to make sure that the quantity is always greater than or equal to zero. We can show the interesting aspects of the Shannon entropy by example. Going back to our original example, we wanted to assign probabilities to the possible microstates given our macroscopic information of 3e energy and there being four total spins. The Shannon entropy is at its minimum when we are absolutely certain with probability one that our system is in a specific microstate. And interestingly, it is at a maximum when we are completely ignorant to what microstate we are in, which in this case is when all the states are equally likely. 
Therefore, we can view the Shannon entropy as the amount of ignorance we have given a specific probability distribution on our microstates. You might have realized from an earlier slide that we are quite close to the Boltzmann definition of entropy. In our example, there was four possible microstates and therefore maximizing the Shannon entropy gave us back the Boltzmann entropy formula where we, where we can set the constant K to be Boltzmann's constant. This interesting example showcases that the Boltzmann entropy formula is a straightforward consequence of maximizing the Shannon entropy. Maximizing the Shannon entropy gives us the distribution of maximum ignor ignorance, a completely unbiased way of selecting probabilities for our microstates. So putting this all together, if we want to compute the most unbiased probabilities for the microstates, we simply maximize the Shannon entropy with the constraints given to us by the macrostate. The resulting distribution will allow us to make unbiased predictions about other physical quantities on average that are not available to us through our macro, macro state information. Plugging the probabilities back into the formula gives us the thermodynamic entropy. And this whole process actually has a name. It's called the Gibbs algorithm and was championed by Edwin Thompson Jaynes in a famous paper outlining how statistical mechanics can be interpreted subjectively as a method of statistical inference. I'll, link, I'll leave a link to his paper in the description. This formulation tells us the best and unbiased way to compute average properties of our system that are not given to us directly by the macro state. But, but what would happen throughout all of this if we only knew the average energy of the spins, or what if we didn't know the energy at all? The principle would actually be the same. It's very simple. Given the information you have, perhaps in this case, the average energy of each spin, we can maximize the entropy formula and pick the best possible probabilities given the information we were provided. So it is with this perspective that the entropy is the amount of ignorance we have about the system in question. In this way of thinking about it, as James writes in his paper, entropy becomes the primitive concept with which we work more fundamental even than energy. While we only scratch the surface of the power of this argument, it can be straightforwardly used to derive all of the probability distributions one sees in equilibrium statistical mechanics. This is in general called Jane's principle of maximum entropy, and it is quite an elegant and first principles way to derive equilibrium statistical mechanics. In it, we conclude that statistical mechanics doesn't need to be treated strictly as a physical theory with underlying assumptions that are not present in the laws of nature. And instead, we can just treat it for what it is, which is a statistical inference based on limited information. I will post a follow-up video uh, to this outlining Jane's principle of maximum entropy. Um, and as always, guys, I hope you liked the video. Please like and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and feel free to leave a comment below.